All right, welcome everyone to the second session of the Prevalence Reduction Innovation Forum learning series. Today's session will feature a presentation on the PRIF child sex trafficking study that was conducted in Recife, Brazil. I am Dr. Lydia Letraris, Associate Director of the Center on Human Trafficking Research and Outreach within the School of Social Work at the University of Georgia and the coordinator of the PRIF. Um, you can use the Q&A function to ask any questions that you have and our speakers will address them after their main presentation. Uh, I would now like to introduce Dr. David Oketch, Director of the Center on Human Trafficking Research and Outreach and Director of the PRIF. Dr. Oketch. Thank you so much, Lydia, and good morning, everybody. Nice to see faces here and names that I know and a few names that I've not met before. So I'm so glad that you took your time to join us. For those of you who have no idea about what PRIF was, uh, PRIF's original idea was to try to help us really have better ways, uh, methodologies, and something techniques in estimating the prevalence of human trafficking. And we are very honored that, uh, the, uh, that the Freedom Fund actually was one of our partners uh, working in Brazil. And uh, we are very honored today to have uh, Carl Kendall, Elizabeth Anderson, and Deborah Aranya. And uh, so their project estimated the signs of the population of female children and adolescents less than 18 years of age experiencing commercial sex exploitation of children, or CSEC, in the Recife metropolitan area in Brazil. The study used one successive sampling population size estimation method by a respondent driven sampling among young women, sex workers between the ages of 18 to 21, who began exchanging sex for money, favors or goods, or were otherwise commercially sexually exploited at least once before their 18th birthday. And they also used the network scale up method with a random sample of uh, RMA residents contacted by phone. And RMA in this case stands for the uh, Recife metropolitan area. So. Welcome very much, our colleagues uh, from the Freedom Fund, and uh, over to you, Carl. You know, I, actually, it's Elizabeth that will uh, kick off. Okay, sorry, over to you, Elizabeth. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. I'm going to start, start uh, sharing my screen. Um, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, and thank you, Dr. Urkach and Dr. Alan Sararis for the introduction. Um, as, as mentioned, um, myself, Carl Kendall, and Deborah Aranya will be presenting today, but the research team uh, is, is much broader and includes um, our PI, Dr. Ana Maria Brito, who could not join us today, uh, Martu Leal, Lydia Kerr, Mathilde Shore, and Yuki Lo, all of whom um, were, were central contributors to this research. Um, so this, the present study uh, focuses on commercial sexual exploitation of children, which is any use of children under the age of 18 to perform sexual acts in exchange for something. So typically money, but as well as good and favors. Um, in the Brazilian context, that can also ex include things like um, drugs, um, a ride to a party, access to a party, um, lots of things that, that may be favors um, for which um, a minor, and you, most often a minor girl, is exchanging sex. Um, so in addition to penetrative and oral sex, um, we included things like pornography, erotic performances, uh, live streaming, um, anything like that, that's performed by a girl under the age of 18 um, for our particular sample. Um, so we chose the Recife metropolitan area, which is in northeastern Brazil, um, because in, in part because of the proportion of the population living in deprivation, some form of poverty, uh, particularly extreme poverty. Um, in Recife as well, uh, women who began women adult women who are performing commercial sex have the highest proportion nationally um, who began before the age of eighteen uh, to do that. So began in CSEC and are now performing commercial sex as an adult. Um, and something to keep in mind about Brazil is that commercial sex is legal for adults over the age of eighteen, um, and the age of sexual consent in Brazil is fourteen. So we have this kind of four year gap where many girls are sexually active um, and are performing sex in exchange for money, goods, or favors um, and are being exploited um, in that sense. So this particular project had the goals of uh, estimating the population of female children in the, uh, the RMR, the Recife metropolitan region, who have experienced CSEC. Um, and so we did that by looking at adult women um, and asking them retrospectively about their experience when they began um, CSEC. 
Um, and then we secondarily examined forms of violence, exploitation, and other forms of harm that survivors were exposed to, um, as well as the pathways into and out of CSEC. And then finally, um, we collected data um, to inform child protection policies and services, which is part of the Freedom Funds portfolio in Brazil, um, in order to protect CSEC survivors in their communities and to prevent further children from becoming um, victims of CSEC. And with that, I will pass over to Carl uh, to speak about the methods. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks to uh, David and Lydia. Uh, this is an incredibly... Uh, complicated project, the entire project that David and Lydia have run. And uh, uh, with all of us who participated uh, presenting, there often hasn't been enough time to explore some of the topics that we think are, are uh, important for the listening audience. And so we're going to take a little uh, uh, time today to talk a bit more about methods. The methods we chose, uh, particularly RDS or respondent-driven sampling, and uh, some of the why that we chose it. So one uh, method that we use is called respondent-driven sampling. It's a chain link sampling method we'll talk about a, a bit more. And that was the primary method we used to recruit this network of 602 women who completed a face-to-face -face survey. Uh, it was uh, a little uh, difficult because uh, it is illegal uh, for women under the age of 18 to participate in any kind of commercial sex. And there are very steep penalties, both for uh, them, their partners, and any uh, others involved uh, to be there. Uh, so we can't speak directly to any of these girls under 18 years of age, and yet that's the population we're interested in finding out about and fulfilling our, our three objectives. So uh, that meant uh, we talked to a population of uh, sex workers who were 18 to 21 years of age or had just uh, left uh, underage sex work, right? Uh, and they were women who had participated in sex uh, exchange in, in CSEC, as it was called, the commercial sexual exploitation of children before they were 18 years of old, uh, years of age. Um, okay, if, if, if that's kind of clear, but that was necessitated by the ethical review committees that we had to pass our uh, research through. Um, the other method that we adopted as well is called the network scale-up method. And the network scale-up method permits us to contact a range of people who are not uh, uh, engaged in this uh, uh, business uh, to contact people just in the general population. And uh, we call them up and asked about their knowledge of people who may or may not be uh, engaged in sex work uh, before they were 18 years of age. Um, we did this using a random digit dialing approach. So we had one method that permitted us to uh, estimate the total population size, one of our objectives. And we had the respondent driven sampling method that permitted us to uh, 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 respond to all three objectives. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, why did we use uh, respondent-driven sampling? So uh, this is a method that's been wildly, uh, widely used since the 1990s. And just to give it an estimate, I looked up on Google uh, Scholar uh, articles and books that had been published with respondent-driven sampling in the title. And uh, it reported 511,000 of these uh, documents uh, since respondent-driven sampling was developed, as I mentioned, in the 1990s. And there were even 294,000 uh, that had respondent-driven sampling and systematic review uh, in, in the title published as well. Uh, so it's incredibly widely used. Um, and some of the reasons are that there's no sampling frame required. If you had uh, a sampling frame, you could apply some of the more conventional sampling methods. Um, so 
One is there's no frame. You start with some seeds that you've selected yourself and you ask them to recruit people and they recruit people and they recruit people. By restricting the number of people that they can recruit at each link in this chain, um, we can get very long chains. And that's a, a really good way to avoid the bias associated with the people that you originally selected. At the same time, this allows participants to remain anonymous and they're being recruited by their peers. And so we're overcoming perhaps some of the issues surrounding stigma, discrimination, and lack of trust of uh, people who are approaching you to uh, participate in a study. Um, and uh, we believe, and there's substantial evidence and uh, arguments and statisticians continue to debate this, of course, uh, but when operationalized and analyzed correctly, provides representative estimates and confidence intervals about the population sampled. Um, is it fit for purpose in terms of responding to those three objectives? It's uh, among a very small number. There would only be uh, time location sampling uh, among conventional hidden population sampling methods available. Um, and it, it does allow us to uh, generate a, a population size estimate, which uh, uh, time location sampling does not. Um, we have lots of manuals, tools. We have all those publications and free software for analysis. So that also provides us some confidence that uh, uh, there are many scientists committed to this particular method and development and design will continue. Uh, there are some citations at the bottom of this slide for those of you interested. Next slide, please. So uh, we also modified the way that we conducted classical RDS by applying some uh, more recent tools. We use uh, Krista Geil's uh, sequential sampling estimator um, to improve the calculation of weights. So uh, each of the numbers that we'll provide you uh, later on in this presentation of the results uh, will have been weighted by this uh, particular estimator. A and uh, it also permits us to generate a population size uh, estimation. Um, Katie McLaughlin also has developed uh, uh, more recently something called visibility imputation that addresses an important assumption in RDS. So uh, we ask participants in RDS through a cascade of questions. We finally come to a question that asks, uh, how many people do you know who fit the eligibility criteria? Uh, would you invite to participate in this study? Right? And uh, so that gives us an estimate of the total population from which the three people who participated come from. So we have an estimate of the proportion of the sample that's engaged in the, in the study. Well, Katie thought about, and many uh, researchers thought about the issue that you could have this, uh, you know, in the moment, you could think of six people or 10 people that you might be able to give this coupon to, uh, but of those six uh, or 10 people, uh, four might be traveling, they could be on vacation, they could be out of town, uh, they, they could be unwilling actually to participate even though you think uh, they are. And so uh, Katie came up with an adjustment to think about their true potential of them participating in the study. Uh, and this also um, helps us adjust for outliers. Right, and uh, so we applied this uh, visibility imputation as well, um, and so uh, that'll be uh, embedded in in the results here that we provide. And we're also going to show some of the other tools that come along with uh, using classical RDS, uh, and those are these graphs for convergence uh, and uh, bottlenecks in recruitment. Next slide, please. So here we have a recruitment tree. Um, this particular recruitment tree shows by color uh, different municipalities within the Recife metropolitan area uh, where um, women were 
uh, plying their trade. Okay, so the purple is Recife, another area is Olinda, uh, and we, because there were relatively uh, few people uh, reported from any of the other municipalities, uh, we just had a, a blue color. And as you can see, almost all of our sample uh, is from Recife, and uh, that will uh, uh, prove to be an important consideration in evaluating our uh, uh, results. Uh, the other thing to take from this recruitment tree is that we have two major components. Uh, having major components is a good thing uh, because it means we have re relatively long chains. And those long chains mean uh, that the result of the people in the middle and the end of the chain are going to be independent of that seed uh, selected at the top. So two seeds produce these two large uh, chains. Next slide, please. Here we show uh, recruits by waves. Uh, so we see a kind of uh, curve. Uh, the curve demonstrates that the, the recruitment peaked in wave six and wave seven, but then began to fall off. And it means we're probably reaching uh, the end of that uh, population to uh, recruit. Okay, so it gives us some important uh, evidence about uh, recruitment uh, and also shows we have uh, a uh, relatively uh, large pool of uh, longer uh, links or slides. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, here's a scatter plot of network size by wave. So each column there is uh, one of those 11 waves. And the red bar there is the median. And uh, you can see uh, the median size that's reported for that wave of these network sizes that are reported, right? And these are adjusted for the visibility imputation. We see a little drop off at the end, uh, and which tells us we're using up lots of members of the population in this recruitment, but it's not substantial. Uh, and uh, we would have preferred if, uh, the decline there at the end uh, uh, was uh, lower, okay? Next uh, slide, please. Here we have a convergence plot. Uh, so this shows us because uh, the dotted values are the calculated values, and then these reported uh, uh, as each individual is recruited in, into the sample. Uh, we can see relatively stable values as we would expect in the racial composition of the group that we selected. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Brazilian racial classification system, this is uh, self-identification and sort of a color bar is, uh, is used. Uh, but what's important here is that we have uh, stable values that move across the graph. Next uh, slide, please. Here we have a bottleneck plot. So the bottleneck part, we have two, uh, we have the purple and the, and the blue. We have two of these uh, lines, right? Each of them reflects one of the principal components, right? And because we only have two principal components, these are relatively well organized graphs in the sense we only have two. You see how they sort of come together in the first two bars. And in the third bar, there's a substantial difference. Um, the, uh, this is has completed high school or is in uh, college. Huh? Um, and uh, we can see that there's a, a difference in the two uh, networks that we recruited. So there may be a potential bottleneck of uh, girls who had completed uh, college recruiting uh, girls who uh, didn't. Uh, the numbers here are of course small for the population that we're interested in, but it gives us information about where we may not get complete representativity. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, Elizabeth, would you uh, like me to turn this over to Deborah now? Uh, no, could you, would you mind doing the findings or I can right. negotiate? Okay, okay, right. fine, <laughs> thank you. So uh, the, the interesting facts that we focused on in prior 
presentations and also that we've encountered uh, with uh, our audience, uh, in incredible information about the population that we're uh, exploring and some real, really beginning to understand what are the parameters uh, of the terrible economic uh, situation that these girls are in that constitute their vulnerability. Um, so 51.6% of participants had housely, had a monthly household income of uh, reais 1,000 or less, which is equivalent uh, when we collected this information uh, of about $190 a month or less. 44% um, live with a single mother or a, a single potential other income earner. 37.3% um, their guardian worked as a caregiver for the elderly domestic worker or daily laborer, relatively uh, uh, lowly paid uh, professions. 5% uh, uh, at one point in their uh, adolescence had been sent to live in a uh, institution. 3.8% um, lived in an improvised or temporary shelter where were, were on the move most of the time. Um, and about 1% of participants, uh, uh, caretaker worked as a sex worker. 39% um, witnessed frequent episodes of domestic violence at home, and 38.3% reported having first sexual intercourse before the age of 14. 21.2% um, reported experienced sexual violence at least once. And this was the other feature that we got to um, uh, collect using uh, RDS, this rich interview data from relatively recent history uh, in, in these uh, women's lives. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Um, first entry into CSEC, uh, uh, of course, 100% of the participants exchanged sex or other acts uh, under 18 years of age. That was an eligibility uh, criteria. 80% uh, though were still enrolled in school uh, when they were first involved, uh, opening up uh, some thinking about potential interventions. 22.4% um, were under 15 years of age when they were first involved in c -sex. So unfortunately, the problem starts uh, very, very young. 58.4% um, were approached by someone they knew to get involved. Um, and 45.9% uh, received uh, $19 or less of the first time they were involved in CSEC. You can still imagine that $19 is a, a lot of money. Uh, reasons for entering 81.6% said uh, economic pr pressure. We didn't make this an exclusive choice. There were many choices, but e economic pressure came out on top. Uh, having access to consumer goods uh, connected to that was mentioned by 71.5. Uh, maintain basic needs, 37.1. Uh, lack of training or qualifications for other kinds of uh, remunerated uh, employment, 34.8%. Um, uh, about a quarter said that they were strongly influenced or, or forced to participate in the trade. Um, Pregnancy was cited as a cause uh, by 15% of, of our sample as entering uh, CSEC, uh, and about 10% said family abandoned. A portrait of vulnerability. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, we did some uh, qualitative data collection uh, as well as for formative research to develop the uh, RDS study. Um, and we got some uh, quotes which we've used in our uh, reports that have made uh, uh, this data more uh, meaningful. Uh, so one uh, of our respondents said, my grandmother was responsible for me because she's elderly. I told her I would help her at 16, 17. There was no other way for me to earn, no one to help us. So I entered this life. So she was doing it for family. Uh, something that uh, if you, you're familiar with uh, uh, literature on sex workers around the world, uh, we hear repeated often. Um, my family was threatening to throw me out of the house. I would go without eating. I thought I'll try uh, 
commercial sex at least one time to see if it's any good. I was 13 uh, and the sex was with a friend. So often began with someone they knew and it's sort of sliding down this uh, economic uh, slide into um, commercial sex. Next slide, please. Forms of, co of uh, coercion and control, 31% felt they had been lied to once they were engaged in CSEC uh, with what actually happens uh, different from what they had agreed to. 24.7% um, reported feeling pressured to engage in commercial sex. 12.5% uh, understood that they would lose what they had already earned if they gave up work, that is, if they stopped uh, where they were currently working. 11.3% uh, have been forced to have sex with someone to pay back money that was owed and uh, that, that could have been uh, money they owed themselves or someone in their family owed. 3.4% <clears throat> had a debt imposed on them without their consent and 1.8% experienced kidnapping, confinement or immobilization associated with CSEC. These are uh, important indicators in terms of uh, sexual trafficking. Um, in terms of violence and dependency, 55% uh, reported emotional abuse, 33% uh, uh, reported physical violence, 24.7% uh, um, um, felt that they were unable to refuse uh, working in CSEC, uh, and 12.8% uh, reported that they had witnessed uh, police violence. Um, either in their venue where they worked or near them. Um, in terms of drug dependency, while they were engaged in CSEC, 23% uh, reported that. Uh, that would have included any uh, of the common illegal drugs here in uh, Brazil. And in terms of alcohol dependency during CSEC, 11.6%. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, in terms of access to services while uh, engaged in CSEC, 79.5% um, reported uh, visiting healthcare establishments. Most of them are public uh, clinics maintained by SUS, uh, the unitary healthcare system in uh, Brazil. So healthcare clinics may be uh, another uh, opportunity uh, to uh, engage with uh, women in CSEC. Uh, there, there were focused sexual health uh, clinics, um, some of which targeted uh, older sex workers, uh, but are well known in the community. 58.1% of uh, uh, the respondents reported uh, using those. Um, in terms of uh, receiving social assistance or welfare, um, that is that their household was signed up for one of the uh, social benefit programs, uh, that was 18.9% of our population. Uh, in, in terms of having been approached for uh, other employment programs, about 15% of our sample. Um, in terms of taking advantage of any outreach uh, services for testing for S STDs or other services, uh, that was reported by almost 14% of our population. Um, and that they had uh, taken advantage of NGOs that were distributing uh, food, 11.5%. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, receiving any kind of benefit from a program or interacting with a program that was directly addressed uh, to underage sex workers, that was only 2.6%. And that becomes uh, uh, an important gap in providing services. Next slide, please. Okay, so how many uh, women are we talking about? In, in terms of the network scale-up method, that is uh, calling a random digit dialing of, of cell phones, cell phone coverage is uh, very high in Recife, um, and asking them if they knew uh, of uh, women who were engaged in underage sex, came up with a value of 19,700. Uh, with an interquartile range between 25 and 75 percent of 10,000 to 40,000. Okay. Um, and that was uh, 
inserted into SSPSC, into this population size estimate as a prior uh, to help us calculate the information that we got from the respondent-driven sampling study. And that uh, gave us uh, a number of 22,600, uh, not dissimilar to the prior, and an interquartile range from 12,000 to 44,000, slightly larger, but with a, a large overlap. So if we take those numbers and take the, uh, the numbers generated uh, from the decennial census, and in this case, it would have been the uh, decennial census from 2010, um, uh, that would constitute 16.7% of young women in the Recife metropolitan area um, who were CSEC uh, survivors, okay? Um, that may seem um, high, um, and uh, it would be nice to have enough time to talk that through. Uh, but I think one of the important issues is that uh, experts uh, who worked in Recife uh, didn't think that the number was out of uh, uh, bounds. Okay, next slide, please. Um, On this one, Carl, in, I'd like to yeah. pass over to Deborah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Carl. So uh, talking about how this uh, research uh, was developed uh, and how we are uh, engaging with the researchers in the region. So besides uh, the collaboration between uh, the researchers from uh, uh, University of Georgia and on researchers in Brazil, uh, we also had an advisory group uh, that was closely engaged uh, with the research team. And that was comprised of a, a wider, wider uh, group, uh, including women in commercial sex, uh, people that were subject matters in commercial sexual exploitation, uh, trafficking in persons, other researchers, uh, so that we can ensure that uh, the uh, both approaches uh, and the recommendations were of, of the study were appropriate to the context. So this group was very closely involved from. Uh, the early uh, phases of designing the research, designing the study, providing input, um, and also to the tools and, and analysis of findings. So it was a very closely, uh, a very collaborative uh, research uh, in a way of, of engaging, engaging with a wider uh, community uh, in Brazil. Um, at the time we were doing this research, uh, Freedom Fund was also doing other studies uh, on complementary uh, topics of uh, analyzing the policy in Brazil, uh, uh, analyzing uh, the responses uh, to survivors, uh, so uh, analyzing also uh, uh, the profile and perceptions of um, potential perpetrators. So uh, this study was also an opportunity uh, as we developed uh, the process to promote collaboration with those other uh, researchers engaged in all, all, uh, also other studies. So it was an opportunity also to check uh, the findings that we'll, we're having in different studies, um, sharing methodologies that, uh, these methodologies that were inspiring also some other studies uh, and researchers and, and discuss collectively uh, the findings of the different studies, um, as well as identify areas that we still don't know enough. One of those areas is online sex trafficking. Uh, we have found in, in this study that one of the, the, the ways is recruiting uh, online. Uh, so uh, researching more about the, the implications of uh, online, of uh, social uh, platforms and uh, websites in, in terms of sex trafficking is still needed. Um, in, in, in any way, uh, there is a wide recognition of the relevance of the studies, both by the NGOs uh, as well as the government. We have done recently an evaluation uh, that uh, the feedback we've received uh, from uh, all of those is that the study has been uh, very important to influence uh, and help them to target uh, future investments uh, and uh, bring in the subject, bring, bring in the issue, the agenda uh, to the government uh, priority through uh, collective advocacy efforts of NGOs uh, by use of the data, the impressive, impressive data that this study uh, 
reveals. So next, please. Uh, this is uh, these are pictures of uh, some of the events we had uh, held earlier this year. Uh, sorry, last year uh, during the um, May, which is the month to uh, combat sexual violence uh, against children in Brazil. Um, so we did some events in the region of Recife as well uh, as uh, in Brasilia uh, with the parliaments, the state and national parliament uh, and uh, prosecution offices. Uh, and other government uh, agencies to discuss the findings, the preliminary findings we had at the time and make sure we didn't lose the momentum, but that you could still already discuss with them uh, the implications of those findings. Uh, and as, as a result of that, the, the agenda of sexual exploitation has really become, uh, again, at the, at the light of uh, the state and most municipal and, and federal governments. Um, there's been commitments announced from uh, both, uh, from all levels uh, to uh, boost actions, um, start, uh, the, the municipal government has started um, to uh, joint work uh, on addressing uh, sexual exploitation in certain high uh, risk areas of the city. Uh, the state government uh, is uh, working to develop uh, state plan uh, to combat the issue and at federal government, uh, President Lula has announced the commitment to eradicate to a country free of sexual exploitation and announced several measures. So uh, this is uh, these are some uh, of uh, of the scenario and of course uh, there's a lot of things that have influenced uh, those uh, new government uh, commitments, but the uh, the study has definitely uh, been part uh, of the big of getting this uh, issue in the agenda in Brazil as well. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so some of uh, the ways that the, we are using the study uh, as the Freedom Fund to influence uh, programs, anti-trafficking programs, our own programs in Brazil. Uh, one is a powerful way is definitely to use it uh, the data uh, that is has come up for, from the program uh, to increase visibility of the issue and boost the government responses, but also around that to uh, to press for uh, adequate allocation of public budgets to address the issue in Brazil. Uh, in terms of our own work and our own program, uh, some priorities have been confirmed through these studies, uh, which the NGOs, uh, in a way, also had uh, anecdotal evidence, but now they've also have become more clear uh, that um, it's very important to do uh, prevention work uh, in schools and communities, uh, since we see that 80% uh, of the girls are at school uh, when they are first recruited into CSACs. So it's very important that both schools and communities have prevention programs and are uh, vigilant to uh, start identifying those cases as soon as possible, which also means training um, education uh, teams, health workers to identify and report and also to address those problems uh, in a preventive way uh, in the schools. Another uh, Big priority is how uh, we help in terms of the economic pressure, uh, which is the key driver, uh, as we have seen uh, in the root causes of why children engage in CSAC. So uh, helping them to uh, both increase their education opportunities, but also uh, young girls uh, to have access to job opportunities, uh, including uh, especially through the apprenticeship law in Brazil, uh, which is a way that uh, young people can have both uh, continue their education while, while having uh, opportunity, uh, professional opportunity in businesses. On the, uh, on the other hand, it's also very important to raise aware of businesses about the unique needs uh, of those apprentices, of those populations. Um, and an another po very important priority uh, is uh, health uh, interventions uh, on sexual reprodu uh, reproductive rights. Uh, we see that uh, the pregnancy is also a, a reason why uh, 
uh, many girls uh, engage in CSEC or once they're engaged, it's much harder to leave when they have the increased economic pressure of being a mother. So also uh, have those kinds of interventions are very, very important, as well as um, uh, prevention of drug uh, and alcohol uh, abuses. And lastly, another area that's become very important uh, are campaigns, how to, to reduce the demand. So campaigns that uh, can be targeted to uh, some industries where uh, the research has also evidence, like the tourism industries, uh, the research evidence, uh, the use of bars and hotels uh, and entertainment venues. Uh, so it's very important uh, that there are programs are targeted at those industries as well as transportation uh, sector, has, which also has an important role uh, in the recruitment of girls uh, and online uh, as well. So next slide, please. Uh, as a follow-up of this study, we have uh, designed an extension, a prefix, the, we call the Prefix Extension Project, which is uh, interventions in response to the study. Uh, and uh, the main goal is to reduce the sexual exploitation uh, of children in those two cities, Recife and Olinda in Pernambuco. Uh, we have uh, three main uh, objectives uh, with specific outcomes. The first being that the uh, government and civil society uh, set common guidelines and targets uh, to address uh, CSAC and that they're monitoring uh, those achievements of targets. Second objective is that decision makers and frontline organizations are using effective leaders um, evidences like from these research and others to guide their work. And lastly, that children that are vulnerable and survivors of CSAC, CSAC have access to uh, support that they need, like information, trauma-informed services, and pre-vocational education, so that they're able to uh, prevent entering and, and uh, more able to leave uh, commercial sexual exploitation. Uh, we have four partners that have been closely engaged uh, in these as well, in, as in further studies, Colectivo Mulher Vida, Instituto Aliança Childhood, and Promundo. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, these are some of the roles of those partners of Colectivo and training. It's very focused on working in schools and health centers, raising awareness also around uh, children, uh, young people in communities. One of the questions here was if uh, health workers uh, have the duty to report. Yes, they uh, are required to report uh, CSAC. Uh, so any a professional uh, that knows about the case of CSAC is required to report. And this is one of the things that Colectivo Mulher Vida has been doing is training them uh, on uh, of knowing how to do those reports. Uh, Instituto Alianza has been working directly uh, with survivors and also frontline services assisting them. And with survivors, they're specifically working on uh, pre, pre vocational uh, training, uh, education, and inclusion uh, in opportunities in the world of work. Uh, childhood is working to implement the protected listening law across the whole child protection system to avoid uh, re-victimization of children uh, in the legal process. And lastly, Premundo uh, has done further another study on the profile motivations of perpetrators of CSAC. So it's a number of, of different interventions that was testing and uh, have been started while we were uh, doing the studies. Uh, and uh, we basically have confirmed the need for those work, especially uh, work, preventive work in schools. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. And uh, we welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Deborah and Carl and Elizabeth for this informative presentation. Uh, we have quite a few questions. And so I will just go through them. And if uh, someone on the team could uh, answer, that would be great. Uh, you already answered, Deborah, the question about um, um, healthcare and reporting. So the next 
uh, question is, um, can you please uh, maybe repeat about why the research surveyed adult females instead of current uh, child victims of sexual exploitation? Um, you, my, yes. Uh, so we were not permitted to uh, talk directly to uh, uh, girls who were currently being exploited by sex. Uh, the only legal uh, opportunity uh, uh, that was available for us would be to report them. Um, and uh, our ethical review committee, uh, our ethical review committees did not permit us to uh, talk to them directly at all. Um, I don't know if there are possibilities in the future for waivers or other kinds of considerations, but those uh, those are decisions that take place uh, much above my uh, pay grade. Thank you, Carl. Um, did you ask about reporting to authorities? And if you did, what were the results? And if you didn't, uh, guess why or why uh, not? And uh, interesting question. No, we did not uh, directly ask uh, the women if they ever or, or anyone on their behalf uh, reported an activity uh, to the police. Uh, I, I, I guess we sort of felt that would be a no-go for our ethical review uh, committee as well. Uh -huh. um, I would add to that one as well in one of our other studies that Deborah mentioned with Promundo. Um, we did... Uh, collect some information on prosecution um, uh, of CSEC, and it, it's it's fairly rare um, that a crime would be prosecuted as CSEC. Um, it's usually somewhat, it's, you know, either sexual assault or something else that a prosecution goes through. Um, so, and then maybe Deborah can speak a little bit more about um, the, re the reporting work that we were doing. Uh Exactly, Elizabeth. And also, it's very common that girls are just uh, re-traumatized in the process. So uh, usually when girls engage in CSAC, they're already doing that as a result of uh, of like a support, uh, you know, from families, from state, from society. So they turn to sexual exploitation uh, in a way as a, as a way that they see uh, to... Uh, even uh, sustain their basic needs uh, or have other access. So they will, as the girls will uh, often not be the ones to report uh, as they uh, feel of those cases will be seen as forced. Uh, so it's usually you know, more the result of uh, imbalance and a power imbalance and, and their vulnerability. Uh, so it, it is our duty as uh, adults and society to really understand that complexity and uh, and who needs to be intervening and supporting them is, is usually an adult uh, that would have the capacity to do that. Thanks, everyone. And um, could you explain a little bit more about your prevalence estimate, how you get that uh, based on NSUM? Um, so RDS actually was a separate methodology, but, and then how your estimate compares to other CSAC estimates in other geographies. And there's also a related question about maybe some more detail on how, um, about your confidence interval. Can you explain more detail on the confidence interval around the prevalence estimate? Um, so I think the first part of that question has to do with calculating prevalence. Um, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And how you calculated it based on, have an, yes, uh, on, on the ensemble. Yeah. Great. Well, we're going to have a numerator and a denominator. The denominator is going to be the population of uh, uh, women who have the potential to have been uh, uh, CSEC. Right. So it's it's uh, girls in a CFA metropolitan area of a certain age. In a certain age profile, right? Now, uh, in 2010, uh, there was a new uh, census that was conducted in Brazil, but it wasn't conducted in 2020, and the results from the new census weren't uh, available for us to uh, uh, calculate. So we had to use projections from the 2010 census of the number of uh, girls of that age who would be there. So the the SSPSE or NSUM generated that uh, 
median and actually generates a probability of values, which is the confidence in intervals. And then we use these uh, projections that the government uh, uh, provided uh, for every year uh, following that 2010 uh, census, right? So that's how pre prevalence is uh, conducted. In terms of the confidence intervals, it's just that. All these methods, all these estimators um, generate a probability. And so what we give you for that number is the median of that. Uh, estimate, okay? Uh, in terms of uh, other ways to calculate this, um, we conducted uh, uh, a, uh, as, as part of a national RDS sampling plan back in 2016, uh, we conducted surveys of sex workers um, of all ages, right? Um, and uh, we asked them, if they had participated in uh, in commercial sex, in exploited sex, before they were 18 years of, of age. And so we got an estimate, and that was 60-some uh, percent. I, I, I don't want to report the exact number because I, I, I don't just have it to hand. So that's one indirect uh, uh, notion of the magnitude of participation in uh, CSEC. Um, there aren't any other direct studies to calculate this amount. There are some published accounts uh, based on uncertain methodologies that have reported uh, 500,000 for all of Brazil as a whole and uh, various other estimates, but we don't really have uh, other direct estimates beside NSUM and uh, RDS. And in terms of how NSUM works, Basically, it asks each person who, who agrees to respond, uh, and there's often a fair bit of uh, recruitment bias in this, right? Of course, but in any event, we ask each person who responds what their social network size is in more or less detail. And then we try to see the proportion of that network size that might be sex workers and that might be sex workers who worked before they were 18 years of age. So that's the logic behind uh, NSA. Uh, and that too comes out of the end of the 20th century. Thank you, Carl. I have another uh, logical question for you. Um, there is a comment. I appreciate that you considered disability imputation into the SSPSC and did um, was visibility factor also taken into account for the NSUM estimation? No, no, no. Uh, we don't have the uh, uh, routines uh, developed to how to take NSUM data and apply it. We, we, uh, we. Um, basically, what what the visibility imputation does is it looks at the uh, network size. Uh, and tries to um, looks at the overall sample, look, looks at the particular individual involved, and then tries to see what that network size contributes to uh, the imputation of visibility, the likelihood of being uh, recruited. Um, the logic shifts if you go to NSUM. NSUM is itself always comparing the two uh, uh, population sizes total. Um, network size and then the network size of the particular population that you're looking at in, in terms of the samples that are already collected. So I'm not quite sure how that would work. Um, I, you know, uh, it's an interesting question and we can certainly talk about extending the range of diagnostics that have de been, been developed uh, for RDS uh, to other kinds of yeah. hidden population sampling methods. Okay, thank you. I'm sort of going to combine a couple of questions. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about the legal ramifications for those who solicit um, these ESEC acts? And does the general population in these communities see CSEC as a problem, which needs to be addressed, or do they perceive other issues being of higher priority? So first is like, what are the legal ramifications for those who solicit? CSEC and then is CSEC seen as a um, 
you know, as a problem or how big of a problem, or do they perceive other issues as higher priority? Deborah, please. Yes. So, uh, yeah, those who solicit uh, uh, sexual services from children, uh, uh, anything uh, committing uh, sexual exploitation crime, so uh, they would be legally responsible. Uh, they would be subject to a crime. They're committing a crime. So this is uh, what happens. But what happens in practice is, is that it's an extremely uh, difficult uh, to uh, prosecute those cases because of you know the requirement for proof. Uh, and sometimes this is you know lost uh, in the process, uh, the credibility of proofs, and uh, even obtaining so is usually there has to be an investigation uh, that uh, an intelligence investigation uh, to uh, conduct that process. And so the protected listening law is one of the ways that we're trying to make uh, the process uh, better to both avoid uh, children uh, being re-victimized by having to tell their stories again and again to different uh, services, whereas also ensuring that uh, the proof uh, there can be uh, better, um, yeah, have, have, uh, have more confidence. Uh, so it is a crime for those do, that exploit children. Um, and under age of 18, uh, 14, uh, uh, the uh, prosecution uh, is bigger, the responsibilities and the penalties are higher, and they're also committing uh, rape, the crime of rape uh, of vulnerable. So uh, there's a combination of crimes. Um, in terms of how the communities perceive, uh, uh, the communities perceive uh, sexual exploitation uh, is a, uh, also as a crime and uh, a part of them perceive them perceive it as a crime but at the other uh, hand they also see it as a very normalized uh, behavior among men so this is an also another study that uh, we uh, have been conducting uh, that ex examining exactly how uh, the communities and uh, men uh, especially uh, perceive uh, this behavior uh, in their communities that needs to be more awareness that uh, this is a crime and especially for those girls that are above 14 because what is considered is that uh, even though uh, all children uh, need to be protected uh, up to the age of 18 uh, in a sense uh, the community sees that above 14 uh, the girl is treated like like a young adult is seen by the community and by men mostly uh, as not as a child anymore. Uh, uh, so that's that's a big part uh, of how the community sees uh, that. And, and it's common that also the children, instead of being protected, are uh, being uh, considered guilty as if they were doing that because they wanted. So there's lack of understanding what is the real situation of girls and in CSAC. Uh, I hope I have answered too. All the questions? Yes, thank you so much, Deborah. Well, it is 1029 Eastern time. Um, so we have a few more questions, but I would, uh, we can take one more. It is, you know, up to our presenters. If um, you're available for maybe one more question, is that? Um, yes, let's do one more. And, okay. So how about, um, since you can see it, would you like to uh, take one of these? I will perhaps, uh, leave it up to you and then we can answer the other ones um, by email. Um, um, Carl, would you like to take the one perhaps on um, the transmission bias, recall bias or barrier effects that come with using NSUM? And then if so, what we did. You're on mute. Yeah, so uh, we did not use any of the newer developments in NSUM. Uh, NSUM was sort of added as a second method to our study, which had been uh, primarily devoted to conducting uh, um, RDS. Uh, and we use a very abbreviated version. We basically uh, developed a questionnaire uh, 
asking people uh, of uh, you know how many of known populations that they know. So how many uh, school teachers do you know? How many uh, uh, women over the age of 65 who died last year do you know? Uh, statistics that we could confirm in with uh, generally available uh, population data, and we compared their knowledge. Um, and uh, needless to say, uh, by not applying any of the newer methods of conducting and some, we did uh, 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 not address any of these other biases that have been uh, uh, the response in the development of ENSUM. We needed a uh, method that could be done without meeting the individual we were recruiting directly that could be done by phone. And if any of you are familiar with uh, telephone interviews, they cannot be uh, uh, very long. Uh, and so we were even worried at the 25 or so questions that we had in our instrument, whether that would be too long for participation. And we had a lot of people drop out of, uh, in terms of not responding uh, to participate in the uh, interview, uh, but uh, uh, we got relatively good numbers on completing the interview survey. So that for us was the trade-off. Um, yeah, I hope that that answers your question. There are, uh, you know, I'm I'm happy to share if you contact me some of the citations we had uh, an an expert on our uh, panel who's a, a Dennis Fian who's a, who's a great uh, and some expert and uh, you should follow up on his publications. I'm 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 happy to send those uh, those citations. Although by the question, it sounds like you're familiar with it. Thank you so much, Carl. And also thank you, Deborah and Elizabeth, for typing in responses to all of our questions um, right now in the last few minutes. For a couple of questions on on um, the focus on on like um, cisgender girls and whether everyone in the study was currently engaged in commercial sex, which they were. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the. Presentation. Thank you, attendees, for all of your uh, great questions. Uh, this was a great presentation. Please, uh, as our communications director posted, uh, this will be available on um, YouTube later today. It was in the chat. We'll also send out an email and be on the lookout for our third uh, session in this PRIF learning series. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend.